Hey everyone, it's Dr. Namani and Dr. Louie back again with the Athlete Spine, and we're really excited to have Dr. Michael Kelly here with us today. So uh, I've known Dr. Kelly for a very, very long time. He was actually my fellowship mentor back uh, uh, in St. Louis, where I was a fellow. Uh, he's currently a professor of orthopedic surgery at UC San Diego, as well as the director of scoliosis surgery at Rady Children's Hospital. So Mike, thanks so much for being on with us. Thanks for the invitation. And I met you when you you were a medical student, remember? That's true. You yeah, actually, that's true. Actually, for, it's, been, uh, it's, been, for, it's been even longer. You kind of blocked that out of your left head. me high and drive yeah. for residency, and you went to New York City. But then we met <laughs> in St. Louis. That's true. Actually, yeah, one of my first uh, first connections to orthopedic surgery was uh, was Dr. Kelly. So it's been a long time, <laughs> and yet you still went through with it. I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. One of the reasons I think we wanted to bring you on today and one of the topics that we want to talk about was sort of based on Drew Rosinski, who was a pitcher for the Oakland A's. And, and it came out that earlier this summer, he underwent a single level lumbar fusion, which is not very common uh, in professional athletes. Um, we, we've talked about cervical fusions, cervical disc replacements, a whole bunch of discectomies and decompressions in the lumbar spine. But we haven't really talked about outside of some scoliosis surgeries and in some adolescents like a lumbar fusion surgery in, in an adult and, and certainly a younger adult who's an athlete. And I think one reason why we want to talk about it is, you know, we see it all the time in talking to our family and friends and certainly our patients, they come in and they hear, you know, a lumbar fusion and, and, and they're devastated with even that recommendation because it, they, they think it's going to be life-changing, life-altering for the wrong reasons. And certainly in the perspective of an athlete, potentially career-ending but, you know, I think Dr. Kelly, who's done this type of work for a long time and, and is certainly an expert in this field, you know, I think one thing we can start off with talking about is, you know, what, what are the expectations in an adult patient who is going to undergo a one or two level lumbar fusion? Um, well, a one or two level lumbar fusion, the expectations should be pain relief and improved function. And I think that's where the discrepancy lies for what patients come in thinking and what we go into the room thinking, right? And that they think that a lumbar fusion is the kiss of death. They even look at uh, Jack Eichel, right? The hockey player who st st stayed out forever because he wanted a cervical disc replacement, not a cervical fusion. A one level cervical fusion is not going to change his range of motion a whole heck of a lot and not going to reduce the number of goals he scores. Yeah. And he, if he's winning, uh, won a Super Bowl after a cervical fusion. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think that a one level fusion for someone who has, you should only get a fusion if you have disability from the problem for the most part, right? For these like one and two level lumbar things, you don't do prophylactic one level fusions. Mm -hmm. You should be disabled enough to require surgery. And then when you're done with surgery, you should be better. You should be walking more, you should be back to running. You know, I, in my practice now, it's all children, um, but they're, they've got their whole life in front of them. And I do fusions for both scoliosis and for things like spondylolisthesis. Mm -hmm. And when they're healed from their high grade spondies and they want to play gymnastics or baseball or hockey or football, I say, go, go get them. Uh, uh, you're going to be better. You're, you're, you're going to do fine. Um, and I mean, a pro athlete like uh, Rosinski or, um, I mean, Tiger Woods, right? That he doesn't swing a golf club like the three of us. Mm -hmm. He swings it like a professional athlete who's the best in the world at what he does. And he did pretty well after he got his problem fixed. And he was not doing well before he got his problem fixed. Uh, and Nate Corey, the UFC MMA guy, I haven't had a spine fusion. I couldn't go do that. Uh, and he got a spine, single level spine fusion and then was back to ultimate fighting. Um, so I think that the, the pro like one of the real problems is that we have a little bit of a bad name. Yeah, um, spine fusion, that. right? Spine fusion doesn't end up in the Wall Street Journal for all of our great successes. It ends up in the Wall Street Journal because of the sort of overutilization of that, which goes back to an appropriately indicated surgery. Um, and then the people that get bad surgery, like they tell everybody. Uh, and there are certain, I'm sure everyone has a friend that's had a spine fusion they don't even know mm -hmm. because you just get on with your life uh and you don't solicit opinions about it until someone says hey i need a doctor and, oh yeah i got someone but other than that the, it's really the failures and the failures are a lot of the times in my opinion like i don't have any 
data to support it, but my opinion is that it's poorly indicated surgery, then more often than not also done poorly. And if it's done poorly, then you're really up the creek, uh, right. which yeah. goes back to sort of, you got to get it right, do it right, indicate it right, and then do it right. And if you do that, you're going to do well. It's going to last a long time. Your life's going to be better and you can get back. If pro sports are what you need, you can get, you can do it. Uh, so I, I tell them that the expectation is more activity rather than less activity. And I think what you said is the key, right? That, that it has to be a problem that actually will improve with spine surgery, right? Because back pain is kind of ubiquitous, you know, in our country and, and, uh, and, and the vast majority of people with back pain don't need a spine fusion, you know, um, but, but there are certain problems, like you said, you know, scoliosis, obviously, uh, that that's progressive or, uh, spinal instability, uh, spondylolisthesis, where there's a slippage of one bone on another, you know, these things, if they're not getting better with conservative treatment and you do a, a proper operation done well, um, like you said, the goal is improved function and, and improved mobility, right? And so, uh, yeah, whether you're a professional athlete or a weekend warrior, I think that's that's true for both of those uh, categories of patients. Yeah, I agree 100%. Yeah, and then we talked about lumbar fusion being done properly, and patients always ask us, you know, what's the chances that I get better? Or why, why did my friend or my family member not do well? And why have they required so many surgeries? Right, I would say half, maybe more than half of the actual outcome of the surgery is the indication itself, right? It's, it's the thought process of why are we doing what we're doing? How do we plan to do it? And then there's the component of the execution. So I think people always ask us, you know, what are we thinking in a lumbar fusion, right? You hear the term and yes, we're taking one segment of bone. There's a disc in between and another segment, we're fusing them together. Um, but the goals of our procedure are so much more than just stabilizing two segments, right? Hopefully, and, and oftentimes there's a component of nerve compression that we're trying to decompress. But Dr. Kelly, you know, what, what else are we considering? And certainly in these athletes that have years in front of them and have activity, like what makes a proper fusion? Like, what do we mean by that? Uh, well, I think this is like, you know, we, the three of us know that this remains a matter of debate. Yeah. Um, and again, like, you know, we joked before about T4 and L1 and the relationships for long segments, but I, my current rant is against categorization of things. And in our world, we always, oh, this, you don't need to worry about alignment in degen surgery. That's a deformity thing. And I would say, I don't know the difference between degen and deformity. I know that we're doing something that is reasonably unnatural right, which is fusing two bones together. And deformity is a nice model for what we should do. And I believe that we should normalize alignment. And when you're doing a one level or a 14 level fusion, the goal is to restore how things were before. And that will minimize the adjacent segment forces. And back to categories like, you know, for the 14 segment fusion, those have big problems called proximal junctional failures. Well, a four or five fusion that's flat has a adjacent segment problem that's called adjacent segment disease. I think they're one and the same, just the magnitudes are, are different. And doing the surgery properly is what's going to give you a durable long-term result. And yeah. I think like, this is why like I look to people like you in particular, Louis, um, because you have this MIS, seriously, the MIS background, but you think it's very like, the outcome is not how long I was in the hospital right. and the amount of surgeons who think that an outpatient surgery is wonderful with malalignment are, is too high. And that's not to say that we can't do minimally invasive surgery properly, nor is it to say that open, open is necessary, but we need to get to a point where we can do all of these things through small holes and make the alignment correct. Yeah. And I mean, what uh, I, I tell people, all hour, time, yeah, you know, the patients get, they get the, you know, I'd rather be in my bed than in a hospital bed, of course, but in three years, would you rather be in that hospital bed again? Probably yeah. not. Well, patients, you know, they, they come in all the time saying, right. Like, well, I heard that if I have a lumbar spine fusion, that means I'm just the, the other levels are going to poop out, you know, within, within a matter of time. And I'm going to need more and more surgery. And, and I tell them all the time like that, you might need more surgery. We can't stop father time, right? You know, so, so discs can age, your bodies will age and your spine will age, but that doesn't necessarily mean that 
if you're if if you have a surgery done well, put in appropriate alignment, that is going to minimize the chance that that actually happens to you, right? But if you have a surgery that's done really badly, then yes, that may happen. You know, the the other part of your spine may fall apart because because of what was done to you, you know, but, and, and, and so I think whether you have a surgery open or whether it's MIS, as long as we follow principles and do, you know, a proper job and put people back to the alignment that they had, you know, when they were 25 years old and had a normal spine, like that's what we should be shooting for. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Again, if you look the deformity world is the extremes, right. And if you look at the deformity world for the 40 year follow-up from the university of Rochester for Harrington rods, where they actually didn't monkey with the alignment of the kids very much. You couldn't do much with a Harrington rod. And if they got fixed to L3, 40 years later, most of those people had ODIs under 10 and had not had more surgery. Yeah. That's remarkable. Yeah. Uh, and yet we have these four or five, oh, then five goes, and then three, four goes. And I think a lot, you know, it's nature, it's nature and nurture, to your point, I, I think, right? And if you do it wrong, you're going to hasten uh nature doing her thing. And we don't want to do that. We want to prolong it as much as we can. Yeah. And I think what I tell a lot of my patients is that the invasiveness of a surgery can be important, right? Because you don't want to hurt that much, but the effectiveness of the surgery far outweighs the invasiveness. And you don't want to sacrifice the effectiveness, effectiveness of a surgery by reducing the invasiveness. And so as long as we keep those principles in mind, I, I think that they're all along a spectrum. You're right. We're not categorizing, you know, maximally effective and minimally invasive, right? It's all within a spectrum where we're taking principles from each part of it and applying it. So, you know, I, I think one of the last questions, you know, I'd like to throw at you today, especially with these athletes and, and lumbar fusions is one question we get all the time is how much stiffer am I going to be? I feel like if you fuse my back, I'm not going to be able to bend anymore. And you had brought up some of these adjacent segments. So, you know, how do we take the adjacent segments and motion? And what do we tell our patients? They're like, you know what? I don't want to walk with a, a straight back where I can't bend and do anything anymore. I I don't like, I'll ask you what your experience is, but I don't think I've ever had a single level fusion patient complain. I think that you need to get into multiple, multiple segments yeah. um, and fusing the majority of sections of the spine for people to complain kid ch even children like children that have lumbar scoliosis that get fixed to l3 is the lowest level so that they have three distal motion segments they do pretty good they go back to sports l4 is where a child will complain mm -hmm. and it takes a lot to get them to complain that said when we were in st louis dr lenke fixed a um a professional taekwondo athlete to the sacrum and she could still put her palms on the floor when she came back for her one-year follow-up. That's impressive. Yeah. I remember yeah. seeing a Bridwell yeah. patient uh, do that in clinic, you know, uh, that was a T4 to pelvis and could put her palms on the floor. <laughs> yeah. So Bridwell, he was always like, he never pushed it for L3 for lumbar yeah. scoliosis. But do you remember the kid that he had fused to L4 and the kid brought back videos of him doing gym, like competitive yeah. gymnastics with flips and stuff? Okay. Yeah. 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 I mean, I can't you do can, that. No hard term. If yeah. there's, yeah, where there's a will, there's a way. Yeah, my my, my patients. Um, but I don't think single level are. fusions. Yeah, complain I just about it. I I just show them my range of motion. I said you're going to be better than me. You know, so <laughs> low expect, very low expectation. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Cool. <laughs> Well, uh, Dr. Kelly, it's been awesome having you on today. I mean, I think that, uh, um, you know, as we continue on, you know, uh, over the next, you know, 10, 10, 20 years, you know, we're going to continue to improve our ability to understand, you know, what is appropriate spinal alignment? How can we make, uh, uh, you know, our outcomes even better with uh, lumbar fusions, whether that's a single level lumbar fusion or a spinal deformity correction and, and really work on making people as normal as they can be and getting people back to better function than what they came in with, right? And that holds true, whether it's a weekend warrior or an athlete, right? Uh, I think we can make people better with our operations. Um, they just have to be done well and for the right reasons. Yeah, I agree. I look forward to watching you two lead the way. Yeah, lots of fun. But the support from people like you, where we enjoy the process of learning each step of the way. So, uh, well, thanks everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, don't forget to like and subscribe and follow us uh, on Instagram at The Athlete's Fine. Take care.